thanks a lot for having me here in beautiful Montreal. I'm going to apologize first off uh, for not saying anything in French. Uh, I think you would hate me if I did. Uh, Greek and Latin are my only foreign languages. And, uh, but relevant to the subject of this talk, I will also say that within the not too distant future, I will be able to address you in perfect French without knowing a word of it. And that's, uh, you heard it here, think about it. Uh, so first principles. Uh, you know, uh, great companies start with big ideas, and those big ideas can often be captured in one line. You know, uh, you may have seen this picture of the early crew at Microsoft. Uh, you know, they look just like you guys do today, or actually a little worse. Um, and, uh, you know, but they had this big idea of a PC on every desk in every home. Of course, we've gone way beyond that now, but that was a big vision that helped shape the modern world. Uh, Larry and Sergey with uh, their vision, oh, I've already gone past, somehow I'm, I'm going too fast here, uh, access to all the world's information, you know, or uh, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, make the world more open and connected. And then, of course, there's me. That's me with the big Coke bottle glasses. And I started out with a, a, a much more modest goal, uh, which was interesting work for interesting people. And just by following my nose, I did find a lot of interesting people, and I started paying attention to what they were doing. And I started telling their story to the world by writing books about it. I realized that there was a lot of, of knowledge that was circulating on the early, day, uh, the early networks that wasn't written down. So I started you know, creating these, these documents. You can see one of our first books that didn't even have, uh, it was just a brown paper cover where you could see through to the title page because we printed it in an edition of 100 copies. And we kind of kept going. And then, using something that Andy Nolman calls retrospective intelligence, after a few years, I realized that our real mission was to change the world by spreading the knowledge of innovators. And reframing that, uh, our business around that mission rather than just around publishing allowed us to do things like uh, create the first uh, uh, web portal, the first commercial site on the World Wide Web, uh, first uh, PC-based web server, uh, uh, it led us early into uh, e-books. It let us uh, branch out from uh, publishing into conferences and uh, venture capital. And so a, a big idea gives you a lot of leverage, particularly if you've gotten a good idea of, of what that is, to get into a lot of different kinds of expressions of that core idea. Now, a big part of what I did was what I call watching the alpha geeks. Okay, let's try again. Sometime, okay, there we go. And this is a page I retrieved back from uh, 2003. Uh, a sysadmin uh, at O'Reilly named Rob Flickinger had made a uh, Wi-Fi antenna out of a Pringles can. And he published about this. And then there was this explosion of geeks experimenting with different kinds of Pringle cans, or different kinds of, of cans, to make antennas so they could beam Wi-Fi down to their local coffee shop. Now, of course, we have uh, Wi-Fi uh, fairly ubiquitously in coffee shops. And we have ubiquitous wireless connectivity. But the geeks told us about that early on. Uh, and, and that's why I, I've kind of used this wonderful phrase from William Gibson a lot, the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. And so um, you know, what was sort of interesting about this, it was also this that this was part of uh, what led us to sort of formulate what we called the maker movement and launch Maker Fair. Uh, how many people here have ever been to a Maker Fair? Uh, some number, yeah, good. Um, you know, which is this worldwide movement of people hacking on hardware. And it was, again, uh, telling us something about the future of hardware. But let me come back to this sort of the obvious prediction, which was everybody wanted Wi-Fi to be everywhere. That's still in the future. We don't have Wi-Fi everywhere. But we do have ubiquitous wireless connectivity. And the thing that's interesting is even when you can see the future in the present, you don't necessarily know all the details of how it's going to turn out. So I'm going to give you a little example of that from history, and then I'm going to tell you uh, uh, about where I think things are going today. So uh, this is really before uh, your time, most of you, although some of you here probably remember these days. But uh, in the early days of free software and open source software, there was a huge focus on software licensing a huge focus on Microsoft as the enemy. And so uh, people like Richard Stallman, uh, people like uh, Eric Raymond and Bruce Perrins at the Open Source Initiative were really focused on licenses. 
And I was sort of a dissenter. I said licenses are important, but they don't actually cause this phenomenon. Why? Because I grew up in the age of, proto of early Unix, which was under a proprietary license, but had all of the same behaviors of people sharing software. So I had a different map of the world. I wrote about it actually in the Wikipedia entry for this uh, book, The Unix Programming Environment. It's funny, because years later, I came across this entry, and I thought, God, that's really great. Whoever, and they went, oh, wait, I wrote that. Because uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it sort of captured exactly what I thought about it. But it's really about this sort of philosophy of Unix, which was of small cooperating pieces, which also became the philosophy of the internet, the World Wide Web. And so I was really focused on this notion that some systems have what you could call an architecture of participation. And I, so I was sort of working that idea for years. And I started thinking about the architecture of the industry. And this is actually a slide back from 2003, uh, where I was really looking at um, the way the industry was constructed. And I was particularly thinking about a piece of really ancient history, which was the history whereby IBM lost control of the computer industry to Microsoft. So in the old days, we had this unitary thing called the computer, which was hardware and software. And Microsoft owned literally 97% of the market. And they would charge you $100,000 just to, to actually move a little jumper from the back of, uh, you know, of a circuit board to another to, to upgrade the machine. You know, if you did it without that, they would inspect and you'd be, you know, I mean, actually, maybe millions of dollars. You know? <laughs> crazy, crazy control. Then along came Microsoft. Well, first along, along came the PC. Commodity hardware. Uh, and, and all of a sudden, Microsoft realized that if hardware became a commodity, something else was going to become valuable. They ended up controlling the software layer. And so I kept meditating on this. And, and I was in this argument with the open source community about the design pattern that I saw here. Because what they saw was, well, we're going to replace that top layer of Microsoft with this new open top layer of, Win uh, you know, of Linux. And I said, no, no, already you know, we can see what's happening that we're replacing the middle layer with Linux. Software is becoming commoditized in the same way that hardware became commoditized. And there's these new proprietary companies. And you can see that how old this is by who's up there. eBay, not, not so important today. Google and Amazon, still important. MapQuest, not at all. Right? But this notion that there were this, this proprietary software as a service layer being built on top of open source. So you kind of have to look at the, the patterns in the way the world is. These, these first principles of what's going on, where is it going, what does it mean? You have to draw a map of the future. So anyway, I ended up with this thing, which Clay Christensen, uh, of, uh, who wrote The uh, Innovator's Dilemma, uh, also wrote about. He called it the law of conservation of attractive profits. He said, when attractive profits disappear at one stage in the value chain because the product becomes modular and commoditized, the opportunity to ach achieve attractive profits with proprietary uh, uh, products will usually emerge at an adjacent stage. So, you know, so basically, hardware was the source of, 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 of uh, proprietary control. Software uh, was sort of a commodity. Then software, hardware became a commodity. Software became valuable. And I, what I saw with open source and the internet was that software was going to become a commodity and that something else was going to be valuable. And that's what led me to data. Uh, so thinking about first principles of driving the future of technology and business gives you this real view of where things are going. So I, you know, for example, didn't just continue with my open source convention, but I launched uh, you know, uh, the Web 2.0 events and then something called Strata and Hadoop World, uh, you know, the Velocity Conference, which is about web performance and operations. By the way, Alistair is deeply involved in, 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 in Strata. But so all this is, is, is by way of saying, think about what you see around you and try to think about the general drivers uh, that are making that happen. And try to think about it in a fresh way. So now we come to the meat here. I want to talk a little bit about the first principles that are driving the future of technology and business today. And I think one of the really important ones is it's not just software that's being commoditized now. Uh, you know, one of the really big things is that people are being commoditized. And we're seeing a lot of warnings about this. Uh, with, um, you know, uh, Oxford University recently did a study predicting that 47% of, of jobs that are available today will soon be able to be done by machines. Uh, uh, this includes white-collar jobs. 
And there's a lot of fear-mongering about this. Here was an article about the, entitled Self-Driving Trucks Are Going to Hit Us Like a, uh, a Human-Driven Truck. Uh, and it's kind of a little overblown. First of all, the future takes longer than people think, or, or rather happens very slowly and then all at once. But secondly, I don't think people have thought deeply enough about the design patterns of what's going to happen as we have more AI, more intelligence infuse our lives. Because it does not actually have to be about replacement. And I actually got a great illustration of this on my way here. There's me at the pilot of our jet, uh, you know, piloting our jet uh, on, on the way over. By the way, thank you to the sponsors for, for, for giving us uh, th that, that enjoyable ride. But I wasn't really piloting the plane. It was an autopilot piloting the plane. And so I could sit there in, in, and I could feel the little you know, adjustments that the, the, you know, the computer was making to the, uh, you know, uh, the controls of the plane as I, as I sat there. I wasn't really doing anything. So this is just like sitting in a Google self-driving car. But we've been actually using self-driving planes for decades, but we still have pilots. So uh, you know, the self-driving trucks may well have drivers long after the, car, the trucks are mostly driving themselves. And there's reasons for that. Uh, but it was very interesting talking to the pilots on, uh, you know, on that flight about just how much they use the autopilot. You know, you'd think, oh, they must do the hard stuff like taking off and landing uh, you know, manually. And you go, no, 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 that's when we can't do it. You know, like at a busy airport like San Francisco, you know, a human pilot could mess up, and, and then you mess up the whole air traffic control. I mean, even never mind crashing. I mean, you know, they can land the plane, but they can't do it as precisely and these things are, are landing very, very tightly. And he also said, yeah, on modern air traffic control, they'll let planes fly much closer together. Why? Because the autopilots are in control, and they're uh, making sure that uh, uh, the planes don't hit each other. So very, very interesting how uh, the technology really becomes uh, an augmentation for, for people. The pilot was, was talking about how much easier it is to do a long flight than when you have to actually be sitting there uh, driving the whole time. I think so we'll find a lot. But there's a pattern here which I've been thinking about, which is uh, that we can do new things with technology. It's not just that we replace people. We augment people, and then we do something else. So up there in the corner of that slide is a picture from uh, Ned Ludd's rebellion you know, of 1811, when the weavers came and smashed the new uh, you know, automatic uh, weaving machines. And they didn't imagine then that the descendants of those machines would allow us to build a city in the desert. I mean, that's a real picture of Dubai. It looks like something out of a science fiction, you know, movie. You know, that tower is half a mile high, you know? And, and you get up there in the top, and you look around, and you go, oh, my God, this is just kind of grown out of the desert. This is crazy-ass shit, you know, uh, uh, from the future. And, you know, we just put a probe in orbit around Jupiter. You know, uh, the picture of CERN there, we've smashed the atom. You know, we've dug tunnels. If you had said to, to one of those guys smashing the machines, you know, we're going to dig a tunnel all the way over to France under the English Channel, they would have said, you know, you're fucking crazy. You're fucking crazy. So I want to ask, when we think about AI, what are we going to be able to do with it that we can't do today? It's a failure of imagination when all we can think about is the jobs that it might take away. We have to think about what can technology do for us in the future that, we, that needs doing that we can't do today. Now, I have another personal example. You saw me with those Coke bottle uh, glasses. This is a little map of all the laser eye surgery places uh, in, uh, you know, in Montreal. They're all over, right? So here's this new job. But I have this great story for when I got my laser eye surgery, the laser eye surgery that lets me read that screen without glasses without contacts, you know, after having, you know, being literally legally blind for most of my life. When I was getting the surgery, the surgeon said, keep looking at the red dot, keep looking at the red dot, keep looking at the red dot. And afterwards they said, what would happen if I didn't look at the red dot? And she said, well, you know, um, the, the laser would stop, but uh, the surgery would just take longer. You know, what that really got across to me was this laser eye surgery could never be done by a human surgeon, right? Because if you move your eye, you know, you're, you know this laser is going to fry, you know, some, the wrong part of your eye. But they have a little map of what they're trying to, you know, excise, and 
the laser is computer controlled and it's doing its thing, right? You go, so here's this amazing new capability that was introduced 15, you know, 20 years ago that, you know, people have taken advantage of that's created new jobs that would be completely impossible. And we're going to have a lot more things like that. You look at something like Grail where Jeff Huber, who used to be at Google, is trying to figure out how to do an early detection blood test for cancer. You know, this is amazing, personalized medicine. These are amazing new capabilities that we're going to get from big data, from AI, and uh, we have to actually think that way. So the general pattern that I'm looking at is uh, what I'm calling in, in the next economy. I'm saying in the next economy, companies don't use technology to get rid of people. They use technology to augment people so they can do things that were previously impossible. And I think that's a super important message for all of you. Think about what you can do to enable people to do things that were previously impossible. So, so um, there's, a, and there's a related principle to this one, which is uh, to use technology to reimagine you know, current processes and workflows. Now, a great example of this is Uber. You know, we actually had connected taxi cabs for a long time. But what did they do? Well, they put a credit card reader in the back. They put a little screen in the back so they could show you ads. And nobody said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Drivers and people, they're augmented. They're all carrying around this device that has real-time location intelligence. They're connected. Wait, we could just rethink the whole way that you call a cab. Oh, and by the way, we can also think about rethink the way that you pay for a cab. In other words, we'll just store the credentials and the act of of consuming uh, you know, the service will be the act of paying for it. This is a step beyond Amazon one click. Right? Just get in the car, get out of the car. Right? And, and so they really rethought the whole way that system could work. But they also augmented the drivers. You know, in some sense, you could not do that job without the technology of the Uber app, without Waze or Google Maps. You know, so, so it created new work by augmenting workers. And Uber has forgotten that. So when they started talking about, well, we're, well, we're going to move to self-driving cars, first of all, big PR black eye for the computer industry because you know, what we're sending out to the message, I mean, think about it. There's, there's kind of a pretty crazy um, streak in Silicon Valley when uh, you have companies, uh, you know, Pal I, I know Ari Gesher is here, was at Palantir for a long time, a company named after the seeing stones that corrupt. Uh, you know, Soylent a company named after you know, a product that was made of people, you know, a food product that was made of people. This is like fucked up messaging. So here, here along, comes, along comes Uber and says, oh yeah, yeah, we're going to get rid of the drivers. Won't that be great? You know, what they should have been saying, hey, yeah, we're going to have self-driving cars, but remember that thing we started doing a couple of years ago where we started offering flu shots? You could get a flu shot on demand. Just think about with self-driving cars, all the other industries we're going to be able to transform in the way we transformed on-demand transportation. Once you can summon people on demand, what else could we do with it? That's the design pattern of the future. And they have to remember that and get back to that and think about how, what are the new capabilities that they're going to be turning on. And so you see this, this uh, empowering people, restructuring industries in a startup uh, that I like called Zipline uh, over in Africa. They're using drones to get blood and, and uh, medicines to remote locations. You know, this is an awesome thing. You, you know, if you were trying to do the old structure of the industry, you say, oh, well, what we have to do is build a network of roads all through Africa. We have to actually build a network of, of, of hospitals. And you go, no, actually, you know, we can't actually do that uh, cost effectively. We can just bypass all that because we can use the new kind of technology to get things on demand where they need to go. And this is sort of a precursor to, I think, a vision of an on-demand world that can bring all kinds of services to us where we are, when we need them, just in time. So I kind of, on, this is a, 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 a slide off of the uh, Next Economy uh, website, but I've kind of tried to identify some of these you know, key principles. And uh, you know, in addition to the ones uh, that I mentioned already, uh, I think that there's this really interesting idea that when we give the work to machines, you know, new work kinds or, or old kinds of work to machines, we're going to be doing new kinds of work that we couldn't imagine previously. 
Uh, Hal Varian uh, has used that line. I'll, I'll get to that later. Uh, there's also this sort of notion of platforms uh, that, that we, um, a lot of the, the new kinds of technologies are platform technologies that enable other startups. They're not just standalone. Um, but there's also a notion, I, I think, that we're going to actually have to get from user experience to worker experience. You know, one of the really important differentiators in a business is are the people who are delivering a service happy. And uh, you, know, you see this playing out right now in the competition between Uber and Lyft. I think uh, 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 Lyft is really using as a differentiator you know, better, you know, better service to their drivers. And it's letting them, the small guy, actually compete uh, with the bigger, better funder competitor. I think it's also, uh, you know, you'll see this in, in uh, companies like Starbucks or, uh, uh, or even something like the Apple Store, where you're kind of trying to add a human element to actually increase the service. You know, we've had years and years of retail getting rid of more and more people. And Apple made the most successful new retail entrant ever. Uh, simply by actually putting people back in, empowering with them, them with technologies that, so they could give really brilliant service. Uh, but there's also another piece, which is that policymakers have to get all this right. Uh, you know, we have a lot of, of, of policy which is aimed at holding back the future. We have to actually engage very deeply on what do we want to get to as a society. And we're dealing with some pretty big, hard issues. Uh, uh, my friend uh, Lewis Hyman has just written a book about the history of, of consumer debt, but he also he talks a lot about the um, uh, what happened in the uh, after the Great Depression. And one of the things that's super interesting was obviously we've all heard about the, you know in, in the U.S. Uh, you know how they they put money into re into effectively the reconstruction. Uh, you know they they built elect electricity with the tel Tennessee Valley Authority getting electrification from 10% of the country to you know, 60% in, f in five years. But it was actually World War II and that led to huge investment in new industries. They took uh, things like, uh, you know, aluminum and, uh, uh, you know, plastics and all these kind of things they had to do for the war. And, and they built the aerospace industry uh, in, within five years. You know, came in a huge new industry because government said, we have to do this. And I sometimes think that actually one of the things that's going to save us from the jobless future that people are afraid of is climate change. Because we're going to go, holy shit, we have to get our act together. We're going to need everybody. We're going to need all the machines, too, because we have this massive, massive challenge. So I think it's really important also when you're thinking about these first principles, think about uh, the uh, grand challenges uh, that we face. I think I might, am I over time? Looks like I may be. It looks like it's counting up rather than down. So, um, so you think about climate change. Think about rebuilding the infrastructure. Uh, think about uh, dealing with the demographic inversion, the fact that, that we're going to have more old people, uh, fewer younger people. Uh, in, income inequality. How are we going to deal with that? Displaced people. Uh, these, are, these are huge problems. How would we actually start to solve some of those problems? So. Sorry, am I over time? Can somebody give? Yeah, I am. OK, so I'm, I'm going to just, just quit here. And uh, uh, I'll, I'm going to put the slides up on uh, SlideShare. And uh, you can see the rest of the talk later. All right? So thank you very, very much. Work on stuff that matters. Work on hard problems and think about how we're going to make a better world. Thank you. Thank you.